we started the local chapter of AVO some 12 or 13 years ago, um, recognizing that people wanted to convene and share information and uh, discuss and interact more than one conference a year. And so in light of that, we started the concept of uh, local chapters. And as we see, uh, ADOS Israel began 10 years ago this month um, and has really been uh, you know, the leader of all the local chapters in terms of the quality of the events, in terms of the consistency and the uh, professionalism. And so with that, I really, you know, Nava Shaked has been at the helm of this all through the years through, you know, various roles and, uh, um, you know, positions that she's held uh, within Israel. And my only conclusion is uh, where Nava goes, uh, success follows. Um, so um, I'm now, uh, uh, you know, historically and until June of this year, I was um, at IBM Research in a number of roles, speech technology, accessibility, education transformation. Um, in June of this year, I transferred to Google um, as accessibility evangelist, much to the humor of many people, like a Jewish evangelist. Um, um, so I'm not now specifically in the area um, of speech, although of course in the area of accessibility, there is so much overlap that I think that there, um, there's relevance you know, to this community as well. And Nava assured me that there's also a lot of interest in the area of accessibility. My role within Google is in what's called corporate engineering, and it's uh, within what's called the Googler experience. So it's ensuring that all of the uh, you know, the software, the product, the environment within Google is accessible for Googlers. There's another group that actually focuses more specifically on the accessibility of Google products, although of course there's a lot of uh, interaction between the two. And as part of this major life shift, um, I've also switched from my long-term friend, which was the Lenovo computer, to MacBook Air, figuring I'm really gonna do the full 180. And, uh, you know, I'm discovering that Apple, you know, is, uh, you know, has some of its own quirks. Um, so I'll be uh, speaking to my slides while not projecting my slides. But then again, since I'm talking about the area of accessibility, that's what you're supposed to be doing anyway, because people could be low vision and people could be blind. And so uh, to some extent, I'm, I'm, I'm living what I'm preaching. So um, I'll be talking about accessibility, what it is and why it matters. Um, I'll talk about some of the assist assistive technologies that people with disabilities use in order to uh, engage with technology, um, some of the standards, and I'll talk about some of the accessibility initiatives across Google in terms of the uh, Android device and YouTube and Hangouts. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the opportunities for wearable computing in terms of really changing the landscape of accessibility. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about speech technologies, the focus at Google, um, and then also uh, kind of bridging the gap between accessibility and speech technologies. Um, you know, what are some of the uh, speech enhancements that can really impact accessibility? So that's the, the call out to the speech development community to sort of think about some of these things and either build them into what you're doing or perhaps in this uh, startup nation, um, uh, you know, create some, uh, you know, new opportunities. And then uh, I'll have some closing comments. So Google's mission um, is, and this is sort of the, the, has been the mission from the very beginning, it is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So accessibility is right there in the mission statement. And by the way, if you also look at mission statements of other companies, I would argue that this is a particularly cool and easy to understand one, uh, you know, compared to sort of the corporate speak of a lot of others. Um, so with this goal, I think accessibility is really at the core of Google's mission. Accessibility refers to how users um, with disabilities access electronic information. And then on the other side, 
how the web content designers and developers need to enable what they create to function with assistive devices to be used by individuals with disabilities. Um, so the goal really as a developer, you don't have to build things that in and of themselves have all of the bells and whistles built in for someone to be able to use it out of the box. There are assistive technologies that will plug in to whatever your programs are. So the goal from the, uh, you know, the designer or developer's point of view is don't build in obstacles. Make sure that you create something so that a user that's using assistive technologies can access the information. One of the pushbacks you get when you talk about uh, accessibility is there's a perception that we're dealing with a very small number of people. Um, but in fact, uh, the statistics speak otherwise. 15% of the world's population has a disability from all sorts of formal census numbers. Sometimes you'll see numbers that are lower in some of the developing countries, which for me suggests basically that they're just not counting it correctly. They don't have the, you know, the means and the mechanisms to actually do an appropriate census count. Indeed, in the developing world, I would argue that the number is going to be that much higher because of you know, you know, fewer, uh, you know, sort of more, uh, you know, medical issues and so on that aren't necessarily addressed in the same way they are in the developed world. Um, uh, in the United States, the probability of having a severe disability is one in 20 for people aged 15 to 24, and it's one in four for people aged 65 to 69. And then you could break it down. Um, these are U.S. numbers. Eight million people have difficulty seeing. Two million of those are fully blind. So, of course, a disability is low vision as well as fully blind. Uh, Seven million people with hearing difficulties, nearly 20 million issues with lifting and grasping. Um, uh, 30 million people have difficulty walking and use a wheelchair or a cane. Again, these are U.S. numbers. Um, so the statistics suggest that this is, you know, we, we are talking about a sizable population. Um, as I mentioned, visual impairments include things like low vision, things like blindness, and also things like color blindness. So that also needs to be built into um, solutions that get created. Disability categories also include temporary disabilities. Um, so if you think about it, someone with a broken mouth, broken mouth, with a broken wrist has difficulty using a mouse, but still needs access to the web you know, to do their day-to-day -day job. Also, as people age, uh, most face a disability of some sort. Um, um, and they say that almost 75% of the population that's over 80 years old um, has a disability. Building in accessibility allows them to keep independence that age would otherwise make difficult. And of course, you know, that, that impacts everyone because if older people are more independent, then it has less impact on the younger people that will otherwise need to care for them. So it's, it's, it goes obviously far beyond the individual, him or herself. Um, it's important for a number of reasons, building in accessibility. So first, it's the right thing to do. Enabling access to government services, to employment, to education, to activities of daily living. So let's start with it's Adavara um, Nahon. It's also the law for many institutions. So there are lots of legal mandates around accessibility. So in the United States, there's Section 508 of the US Rehabilitation Act that indicates that you can't sell to the federal government um, unless you have you know, demonstrable accessibility. Um, so obviously then that becomes you know, a business mandate for anyone that wants to sell to the government. In Israel, there's the Equal Rights for Persons with Disabilities Law. Um, so also another key factor around accessibility is that it offers benefits for all users. Um, so the example they talk about are, uh, um, you know, this is sort of the world of universal design. They talk about the fact that sometimes something that has been designed specifically to enable people with disabilities turns out to have much broader appeal, and so that's the concept of universal design. The example that they always give is curb cuts. You know, sort of on sidewalks, the fact that the, the curb is you know sort of a, is is like a ramp is is open and so you can you know with something with some wheeled device you can cross the street. Now this was 
mandated in the United States, you know, however many decades ago, with a lot of petitioning from people in wheelchairs. And years after this became the law in the United States, they did a sidewalk survey in San Francisco to ask people why they thought those curb cuts were there. And wheelchair access was like number eight. You know, people said, clearly it's for my baby carriage, or it's for my shopping cart, or it's for my bicycle. And so this was this first sort of grand epiphany about universal design, that if you design some of these things, even just with one population in mind, if it's designed correctly, it actually benefits a much broader population. Um, and also accessibility creates market opportunity. It lets businesses reach new customers, reach new markets, and um, you know, this is multiplied as local governments, more and more local governments are saying, even if it's not mandated, we want the same thing that you're giving to the federal government in the United States. So there are a number of assistive technologies. So this is really on the user side. This isn't on the developer side. Um, so a user will have, for example, with severe um, motor impairments, users will have devices, special switches. And they have devices now whereby if a user is only able to move one muscle in their eyebrow, they could actually activate a screen and still remain productive. And actually, I have a friend who was formerly at IBM Research, brilliant woman. She's had ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, sort of complete motor shutdown, and indeed has one muscle that she's still able to move, writes poetry, writes blogs, I mean, is, you know, phenomenally active, and of course, legislate, you know, petitions a lot on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, so, switches that allow you to use whatever motor capability that you have. For the deaf and hard of hearing, the assistive technology of choice uh, would, you know, typically be captioning. Um, for colorblind users, you want to be able to have high contrast so that, you know, certainly you don't want to have a device where your only distinguishing feature is, you know, hit the red button or hit the blue button if they're not able to see the difference between the two. And then for low vision and blind users, there are screen readers, there are braille, dis uh, braille displays. Um, so screen readers, you know, in terms of the things of relevance to the speech community, for people with motor impairments, let's say, you know, you know, limited use of hands, they'll want to be using speech dictation. For people who are deaf and hard of hearing, they will want captioning. Obviously, it's very nice to have a stenographer do all of your captioning. It would be even nicer and a lot less expensive if we got to a point where speech recognition could reliably provide that sort of access. Uh, for low vision and blind users, screen readers. So the fact is, screen readers talk when you can't see it. So they actually read what is on the page for you. So these are sort of the assistive technologies that the community uses. Um, uh, users with low vision depend on magnification software. Um, and sometimes they'll couple magnification software and also speech features. There's an interesting cultural thing that I've noticed. Blind users will, of course, depend on speech because they have no other choice, you know, in terms of reading out what's on a web page and so on. Users with low vision tend to want to use whatever vision they have remaining. And so you will see them magnifying and putting their eyes straight up against the screen before they'll actually you know, move to using screen readers and speech output. But sometimes the idea of having it blended is um, beneficial and helpful. Um, uh, users with mobility issues, I've mentioned, will also often use speech recognition to replace a keyboard and a mouse. Um, there are a number of standards that people can go to in order to figure out what is it that I need to build in in order to create accessible design. So the key are um, uh, what's called the Web Content uh, Accessibility Guidelines, the WCAG. And so this is from the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, and this represents the next generation of guidelines for accessible design. Um, and they give uh, web developers th three levels. There's level A, bare minimum, level AA, that's what most people target, and then there's level, you know, triple A, and that's sort of like the gold standard if you really are building in all of the, um, you know, all of the, you know, bells and whistles for accessibility. And then in individual countries, there are national standards that are increasingly common. Um, so I'll, I'll make available, uh, you know, sort of sites that have these standards. Um, you know, I'll make them available through NAVA. So some tips for building an accessible site. 
uh, make the site easy to read uh, in terms of the letter size and accessible color schemes. Um, so again, you know, there are certain colors that even people that are colorblind are considered, you know, sufficiently good contrast and you sort of need to study them to know them. Obviously it's easy enough to do once you know that you're trying to do it. Make sure that you allow zooming. All images should have appropriate alt text. So what this means is every image um, that you have if you've created some sort of web page needs to have text that describes what it is. Not your responsibility to have a screen reader that reads it out, that's gonna be the user's responsibility. But the problem is if you have designed something where you haven't included the alt text, what the user will hear when they plug in their speech, their text to speech synthesizer and their screen reader will be image, image, image. So yeah, they'll know that there's something that they're not getting, but they're not gonna know what it is. Um, and so there are sort of standards I, this is sort of also interesting because there are now more and more tools that will let you automatically test whether something you have created is accessible. But it still needs the human touch because of course the machine doesn't know whether it's done a great job or just an okay job. Saying a girl in the picture is nice, but obviously you know, there are levels of, you know, if the girl is doing something, there should be more information and so there's still so we haven't yet automated this to the point where humans are out of the loop, so that's always nice news. Um, you have to make sure that your site can be operated with a keyboard and not only with a mouse. You have to provide captions for multimedia. Um, and as I mentioned, all, t all, t all text for images, but actually labels for all of your form fields, all of your buttons, all of your checkboxes, all of your links need to have text underneath it. Um, and don't rely exclusively on touch events like gestures and swiping. You should always have multiple modalities available to the user. Now we'll talk about some of the accessibility initiatives across Google. Um, so the Android device, which is the, you know, the mobile phone that I now proudly, proudly carry in my uh, bag along with my iPhone, so I still have both, um, has a built-in screen, screen reader. Um, um, and designed primarily for blind users. And it adds speech and also vibra vibration feedback and lets users, even though it's touch screen, it lets them explore the device, even though it is a touch screen, and speaks out you know, what is there and so allows them to actually use these devices. I mean, I remember the day when you would say touch screen, obviously you're closing out the blind users, but if you build in these sorts of smarts, even touch screens will be usable by blind users. And there are also, it allows magnif magnification gestures that I'm sure all of us benefit from um, on these small devices, but also certainly for low vision users, that's critical. YouTube has automatic captioning, as you might know. So using speech recognition. Ah, I see. So um, captioning is when you have audio material um, being able to provide the transcribed text um, underneath it synchronized with the audio. So, um, and so you have captioning, you know, on, on television programs and things like that. So, you know, it must have been seen. So it's key not to just have transcription, which would be giving them flat text of what it is that's happening. They want to be able to actually read the text while they're watching what's happening. Was the person smiling when they said this or that? So you really get the whole experience. Um, the gold standard of captioning is still the human stenographer. And um, certainly at Google, uh, a lot of the deaf people are using these very high-end stenography services in order to participate in meetings, in order to watch presentations, and so on. Not automatic, human. Uh, you know, uh, subtext, uh, expensive. Subtext, scarce skill. So, um, you know, it's lovely that, you know, companies like Google and companies like IBM were able to do this, but this is not going to be available for every company. I mean, we're talking about something which is hundreds of dollars, you know, 100 to 200 dollars an hour. And it's not even available in all languages. I don't know what the situation is. So these are sort of like, so it's it, the captioners, it's called CART, um, so I don't even remember what the acronym stands for. But um, these are sort of like courtroom reporters. 
so, so who know how to use these stenography machines that have taken their skill and are now using it with the deaf community. But it's a small population even in the United States. I don't know what it's like in Israel or even if it exists. So the need for some sort of automatic captioning is critical. So the YouTube captioning is, uh, uh, I'm talking to an audience that understands the world of speech technology. So it's completely contingent on what was the quality of the audio going in. Is it a single speaker? Is it a professional speaker? Is it multiple people speaking in noise with accents, in which case you know, we will get the captioning that you could anticipate we are going to get. Now, if your goal is just to sort of scan for topics, that's fine. If you're deaf and hard of hearing and depending on this to get the meaning of what's going on, obviously, you know, having, you know, sort of substandard captioning is not going to be acceptable. So this remains sort of a, a target for the future and something that really needs to be addressed. And of course, at Google and other places, they are looking at this very seriously. Um, there's also uh, in YouTube the option for transcript synchronization. So let's imagine that you now have your YouTube video and it has been transcribed. You could take the transcription you know, uh, enter it and there are tools that will automatically transcribe it so that it will be time aligned with the video and so you could watch it as captioning. So that's sort of a nice additional feature in YouTube that also helps uh, people who are deaf. Um, Google uses Google Hangouts a lot and um, so this is sort of, you know, a new discovery for me. We don't have conference calls, we use Hangouts. We go into a conference room and you press a button for you know, whatever meeting you're supposed to be in and we're all there on video conference. And you could have multiple people participating and so on. Um, so this has not been designed for people with disabilities. That's just the way we communicate at Google all the time. So it was sort of shock to me coming from IBM. It's like, what's my conference call number and passcode? And not only don't we typically have that? We don't even have phones on our desk. So um, it's, you know, this is sort of, you know, everybody just uses their mobile or for conferences and meetings, it's Hangouts. Um, so this has a lot of uh, advantages for people with disabilities. One is you can be on one of these Hangouts and there's an opportunity for a window if you had one of these court cart stenographers captioning for you, you could see another window with the stenography. So therefore, with the captioning, so therefore a deaf person participating could be looking at the screen the way everyone else is and also seeing the captioning on the side. Um, also, you can, as you could imagine, it's a wonderful boon for sign interpretation because you could, you could have the conversation, you could have somebody in one, another window who's signing, so somebody who's deaf there, the deaf person signs back, the signer in, in her, you know, or his window, um, you know, speaks it back. Exactly, exactly, with multiple windows, multiple participants, and so really allows, uh, you know, deaf people to participate, you know, sort of in the same way that everyone else does. Um, wearable computing uh, has a lot of opportunities. I'm sure you have seen Google Glass, um, and so Google Glass, can be an incredible boon um, to people with disabilities. And so some of these, I'll, I'll be talking about some just exploratory opportunities with wearable computing. Um, you can uh, use it to read printed text aloud. So you know, if you are blind, you could look at a sign. Uh, it can read the sign and speak back to you what that sign says. Um, uh, you can use head motions in order to activate controls on your mobile phone. It could be, it could be used as a face direction finder. This is a big deal. Think about someone who's deaf who's participating in a meeting. And even if, they're, if they have captioning going on, there are five people around the table, different people are talking, you don't know who's actually talking, and so the deaf person, just from a social point of view, isn't actually looking at the person who is talking. And actually one of my colleagues who's deaf commented that um, um, while he has captioning for a meeting, so he's looking at his machine, 
there's a, a stenographer who's listening over the phone, captioning for him. So he's able to see the captioning on the screen, but sometimes the person that's talking to him stops talking because since he's not looking at them, they think he's not listening. When indeed he's only listening if he's looking at the screen. But you can create a, a much more socially normal environment if this person, if the deaf person is able to wear, has some sort of wearable device, can look straight at you and have the captioning appear in the device so it creates a more normal social interaction. Um, uh, navigation, including pedestrian indicators for someone who's blind. I mean, so you can imagine, the list goes on and on. I mean, so this is an incredible opportunity for people with motor impairments, for people that are deaf, or for people with vision impairments. Um, speech technologies. So my slide says, are we there yet? So I'll talk a little bit about Google and speech technology. And actually, we were talking about this just around the table uh, you know, in the back of the room um, about some of the advantages that Google has in this space. Um, so the goal of speech technology research at Google is to make speaking to your phones and computers ubiquitous and seamless, and also to make videos on the web accessible and searchable. So this is sort of, this is nice on a couple of dimensions. On one dimension, of course, accessibility, and that's what, you know, that's where my passion is. If actually everything, if all of the, you know, audio on the web is transcribed into perfect text, life is much improved for people with disabilities. From a Google perspective, if they're trying to do things like identify where to put advertising, it's an opportunity if they can convert all this audio into text and figure out, you know, what, are, you know, what is this video talking about and could I put relevant, you know, could I put relevant ads with this video because now I know what it says. So it has both a business app opportunity and also, of course, opportunity for people with disabilities. And what makes Google unique is the computing scale and the data available. So this, you know, truthfully is sort of hard, uh, you, know, uh, you know, given just a higher order, order of magnitude of data available to Google, gives Google a real advantage in terms of, you know, pushing the state of the art, um, you know, because as everybody has always said in, uh, you know, in the speech world, let's see, there's no data like more data. Uh, another CEO from once upon a time said, you could never be too rich too thin or have too much data. So uh, Google clearly, uh, you, know, you know, we can't question the scale of, uh, of data there. Also, it's very user-centric. And so it's possible for Google to conduct live experiments to test and to benchmark uh, new algorithms in a controlled environment. I mean, we might, you know, they could do A-B studies, uh, you, know, we'll, you know, we'll go, you know, this week we'll use this algorithm, next week we'll use another one, we'll see what sort of reaction we get. I mean, it's an incredible research opportunity. Um, and they have a priority to deliver performance in every language on the planet. If we go back to that earlier, making the world's content you know, uh, you know, accessible, um, you know, they're talking about the world. And currently, I think the systems operate in more than 25 languages. Um, and uh, you know, they recognize that indexing and transcribing all of the audio content on the web is gargantuan. Um, you know, the, the videos that are uploaded every day on YouTube include, uh, you know, lectures and newscasts and, uh, you know, cat videos. I guess we don't have to worry about those. And making sense of them requires, uh, you know, noise robustness. Um, if you really are going to do the complete job, music recognition, speaker recognition, language detection, all at, you know, heretofore, uh, you know, unrecognized scales. And so the payoff is immense. I mean, both from a, a Google business perspective and also, um, uh, you know, in terms of impact on the world. Um, so, you know, the, the, the comments on, from the speech team is imagine making every lecture on the web accessible to every language. And this is the kind of impact um, that we're striving for. So Google is very big on impact and can also really, you know, point out what we did today impacted a billion users. And that's, I guess, you know, so that's sort of a, a nice thing to be able to say. Um, I've mentioned text-to-speech synthesis and um, accessibility. 
so clearly, it's critical for blind and also low vision users to have your machine speak back to you. Um, so be able to, you know, continue to have access to, uh, you know, computing. You need to have screen readers and therefore text-to-speech um, text synthesis. Um, and they did, a, um, they did a study actually at Google looking at what were the needs of um, uh, the blind community that you know, live and breathe text-to-speech synthesis and, uh, you know, screen readers. And it's sort of interesting because I think naively I would have thought, I always thought, everyone's concerned about text-to-speech, they want it to be more natural. Well, if you've ever watched a blind person use text-to-speech synthesis, they are listening at rates that are so far beyond the speed that most of us would ever listen to. So indeed, their issue is not naturalness. They're much more concerned with intelligibility, um, much more than things like likability and naturalness and expressiveness and so on. And indeed, sometimes the algorithms that we use in order to make speech expressive and natural intrinsically slow it down. So they would actually rather use something else. So it's just sort of something to keep in mind when you're doing your testing, what the, you know, what the sighted user considers a real win may or may not map to what blind people need. Another issue is latency, extremely important. So they want speed and they want intelligibility. Naturalness, good to have, as long as it doesn't impact intelligibility or speed. Um, they were asked about conversational personal assistance. Uh, the conclusion of the, of the users that were queried is not such a priority. They would rather tell the device what they want to do and have it done well than a device that's telling them what to do. So just again, in terms of, uh, um, exactly, okay, Siri and, and, right, the personal assistants that we think are going to change the world, and maybe they will, but it, you know, there might be a little bit of a disconnect in terms of what one community needs and you know, what others in the community need. Um, some other comments, these were, this was my own querying uh, in the accessibility discussion group within Google, knowing that I was gonna be speaking at this conference saying, if you were talking to the movers and shakers in speech technology and in speech synthesis, what would you be asking for? And so um, uh, one user who lost her voice to ALS um, uh, um, says, uh, you know, I would love to have better auditory markers of punctuation, question marks, exclamation marks, you know, the equivalent of that. She said it just doesn't do a good job and better expression of emotion. Um, uh, others in the blind community were saying the ability to increase or decrease the rate without impacting intelligibility, um, the ability to indicate, indicate format changes by adjusting pitch, position, loudness. For example, the headers on the page make them higher volume, right? Because think about it, if you're blind and you're going through a page, the stuff that we depend on visual markers for, they don't have. Obviously, you don't want to say, this is a header, because then you're going to violate the other maxim of slowing them down. So how can you subtly introduce the sorts of things that will give them the clues that they need? Um, um, so key to understand here is the ability to configure and the, the need to have choice for different communities. So in closing, um, you know, just a few comments. Uh, Technologies like speech recognition and text-to-speech synthesis play a critical role, especially for users with uh, um, disabilities, but be sure to incorporate flexibility for multiple needs and multiple uses. uses. Um, I hope I've made it clear that new products and new technologies create new opportunities for improved access. And finally, be sure to build accessibility into your products and services from the beginning. It, the idea of sprinkling it on like salt and pepper at the end is a nightmare. Never works as well, slows down releases. So it's something that you really need to build in right from the start as a business mandate, as a business opportunity, and also because it's the right thing to do. I have a couple of links to um, sites that will give you more information about standards and accessibility. And with that, I wanted to say thank you. Todaraba.
right. Yes. Replicated it. Right? Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Right, right, but with, I mean, with more data, it would, it would be nice to see, fine, I don't care that there's no human in the loop, but, you know, if you are doing machine learning, demonstrate that you're learning. I'm not so. sure, sure what they're doing. Right, right. 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 Are, are there, I, now again, I've only been at Google for, you know, three months. In, in the Google Israel community, are there people working on speech that you're aware of? No one. It's all someplace else. Okay. I know the speech people at Google, so, you know, we could talk afterwards and I'll. In the U.S., from the U.S.? Right, right. I'll take a quick, I'll, 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 I'll inquire, right, yes. Yes. Right, so, 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 right, so, right, so of course the honest answer would be, I have absolutely no idea, um, but so you, so, and is that a suggestion that you're saying Google Books, right, 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 and that they should be audio books, as in synthesizable? Right, right, right. Okay, I'll I'll. I'll Right. Right. I will explore both of those questions. Sarah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for coming.